Today on Know the Truth, a brand new series from Philip DeCourcy. We were with the world. We were children of disobedience. We were vessels of wrath. But then God in his mercy lifted us up and brought us into a relationship with Jesus Christ and we changed sides. We crossed the battle lines and joined the ranks of the redeemed. It's been said that to make a friend of Christ is to make an enemy of Satan. From the moment we choose to follow the King of Kings, we're enlisted as soldiers in a spiritual army, and we don't want to march into battle empty-handed. Today on Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy, we're beginning a study in Ephesians chapter 6 called Armed and Dangerous, opening up the field manual on spiritual warfare. Learn how to be ready for the fight. So let's get started with today's message. Here's Philip DeCourcy. Some years ago, I was attending a Moody Bible conference, and Jill Briscoe, the wife of Stuart Briscoe, took a session and told the story about being in the air on 9-11. She'd been ministering in her native England, and she was on her way back to the United States where she lives and ministers along with her husband in Wisconsin. And as the horror and tragedy of 9-11 unfolded, her jumbo jet was diverted to Reykjavik in Iceland. And there they spent some tense hours waiting to hear about all that was unfolding back in the United States and in New York and in other places. And while she was there, she noticed a young girl who seemed more than nervous And over a cup of coffee, she got to hear this young girl's story. And it turned out that this young lady had just joined the United States Army. And as the implications of that day began to dawn on her, she turned to Jill Briscoe and she said, I didn't join the Army to go to war. I didn't join the Army to go to war. Now, on the one hand, we might understand this young woman's apprehension. Nobody wants to go to war. Nobody in their right mind. It's ugly. It's horrible. And those that have gone through it wouldn't wish it on anybody, perhaps not even their enemy. Yet on the other hand, we do not understand her response because armies exist to go to war. We train soldiers to fight and to kill. The military exists not to provide jobs or benefits, but to defend the United States of America at a cost. A veteran, it is said, is someone who at one point in his life wrote a blank check payable to the United States of America for an amount up to and including his life. I think we get that. And as I reflect on that young woman's response, I'm challenged to think that there are many in the church who fail to understand that faith in Jesus Christ invariably leads to conflict and war. According to the New Testament, the Christian experience is a battlefield experience. Guys, we need to throw our heads and our hearts around that. That's what we have before us here in Ephesians chapter 6 and verses 10 through 18, where Paul describes the Christian experience as a battlefield experience. We wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers. We're up against the evil one and his minions. Paul will write to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 verses 3 through 4, and what will he call him to? He'll call him to endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Listen, guys, when we make a friend of Christ, we make an enemy of Satan. The Christian life involves a good fight of faith. The Christian is going to live his life under a hail of bullets, all that have their name on them. The Christian life means war. The soldier's life was an apt illustration from Paul's perspective of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. 
And you'll find that metaphor in Ephesians along with other metaphors. In chapter 1, the Christian is presented as a saint. In chapter 2, the Christian is presented as a stone in God's building. In chapter 3, the Christian is presented as a son in God's family. In chapter 4, the Christian is presented as a steward of God's gifts and goodness. In chapter 5, a Christian is presented as a sacrifice, a sweet-smelling aroma to God. And in chapter 6, the Christian is presented as a soldier engaged in conflict. The Christian life means war. We're at war with the flesh. We're at war with the world. We're at war with the devil. We fight with ourselves because of our flesh. Galatians 5 tells us that our flesh wars with the Spirit. We fight with others who are part of a hostile and Christ-rejecting world. And Jesus says in John 15, verse 18 following, if they hated me, they will hate you. And we will fight with an unseen enemy who has made war with God a long time ago. Peter describes him as our adversary who goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter 5, verse 8. The Christian life means war. War with the flesh, war with the world, war with Satan, war with ourselves, war with others, and war with an unseen enemy. And the war will be fought on several fronts. You're in a war, and the fight is going to take place on several fronts. Number one, on the personal front. When you go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25 through 27, Paul is encouraging us not to give ourselves over to unrighteous anger. He will go on to talk about a life of integrity and honesty and hard work. And in the midst of that, as he calls us to live out Christ in our daily lives, he'll say, and give no place to Satan. The war will be fought on the personal front. The war will be fought on the domestic front. Each of us are engaged in family life. We're trying to be good husbands, faithful fathers. We're trying to love our wives as Christ loved the church. We're trying to be pure and faithful in our moral lives within marriage. We're trying to raise our children to be spiritual warriors. And you're going to fight Satan for all of that. We see him worming his way into our personal lives. We mustn't give him any foothold. We see him worming his way into our marriages and into our families. This is going to be fought not only on the personal front, the domestic front, it's going to be fought on the church front. As the church seeks to be a witness for Christ in the world, as the church seeks to take the truth of Jesus Christ to an unbelieving culture, Satan will try to muddy the waters. We see him at work in Acts 5, with Ananias and Sapphira and their deception and how they lied because Satan had indeed tempted them to do that. We read in 1 Timothy 4 verse 1 of doctrines of demons that can infect the church through false teachers. Satan's always trying to cripple and compromise the church. We're going to have to fight him there also. And then finally, this is a war that's going to be fought on a cultural front. According to 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, Satan is the god of this world. This is a Christless culture getting darker by the hour. And we're going to be squeezed in such a culture. We're going to be pushed to the margins. We're going to be ostracized. We may even be persecuted. That's our lot in life as the saints of God, as the ecclesia, the called out ones. Guys, we're in a war, a war for our own spiritual health, a war for the church's purity, a war for our family's strength, and a war for our nation. And given all of that, that's why I want to come to Ephesians 6 verses 10 through 18, because here we have a field manual on spiritual warfare. As you and I work our way through this passage, Paul's going to enroll us into a boot camp that's going to teach us how to fight the good fight. Paul will talk about the soldier's environment and enemy and equipment. This is a passage that's going to make us combat ready. This is a passage that should leave us, once applied to our lives, armed and dangerous for that domestic fight, for that personal fight, for that church fight, for that society fight. 
I want to take this image of the soldier introduced here in chapter 6 of Ephesians and kind of run with it for a while. And no doubt it grabbed Paul's imagination. He was often chained to a Roman soldier. He would have been walking down one of the streets in Greece or the Roman Empire or around Israel, and he would have encountered Roman soldiers decked out in their armor, maybe walking in rank. And it caught his imagination, and he said, you know what? What that reality is physically, there's a spiritual counterpart. He thought about the soldier's uniform, the soldier's courage, the soldier's hardship, obedience, submission, teamwork, and tough living conditions. And he said, that's the Christian life. That's ministry. That's gospel enterprise. Did you know that D.L. Moody almost forbid his choir leader, Mr. Sankey, from singing Onward Christian Soldiers at any of his campaigns? Do you know why? Because Mr. Moody said that he could not think of any group less like an army than the church. Think about it. We come to church when we feel like it. We turn up to the parade ground when we feel like it. We get up in the morning. We don't put our armor on. We don't engage in intercession for the souls of men. We're not courageous, sacrificial. We moan when our living conditions are tough when we pay a price for our faith in Jesus Christ. He's right. There's no group less like an army than the modern evangelical church, and we need to be challenged. C.T. Studd, the great missionary, said that Christians were chocolate soldiers. They melted in the heat of the battle. So let's run through a couple of ideas quickly. I've got several things that this image suggests. Number one, the soldier's enlistment. If you're taking notes, let's think about the soldiers' enlistment. War is all about choosing sides, isn't it? Of battle lines being drawn, of commitments being made. Elijah drew a battle line, didn't he, in the top of Mount Carmel? Faced with the prophets of Baal, 850 in number. What does he say to the people of God? Why do you halt between two opinions? If the Lord is God, serve Him. Step over the line. Choose your sides. Jesus drew a definite line in the sand of Palestine. Remember he said in Matthew 12, verse 30, if you're not for me, you're against me. There's no Switzerland in the spiritual war arena where you can set it out. In Matthew 10, 34 to 36, what did Jesus say? This is a striking text that we often don't look at. He said, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. I came to divide mothers against daughters and fathers against sons. My friend, commitment to Jesus Christ involves drawing lines. And here in Ephesians 6, Paul reminds the Ephesians and us what side of the line the Christian is on when it comes to the cosmic conflict between God and Satan, truth and error, light and darkness, right and wrong. Go back to chapter 2. Verse 1, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. Hey, that's where we once were. That's what we once were. We were on his side. We were with the world. We were children of disobedience. We were vessels of wrath. But then God in his mercy lifted us up and brought us into a relationship with Jesus Christ and we changed sides. We crossed the battle lines. Maybe to borrow the words of Colossians, God transferred us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. I hope you understand that. I hope you understand yourself that upon faith in Christ, you crossed between the battle lines and you joined the ranks of the redeemed. In fact, let's go back to the genesis of this church at Ephesus. Just interestingly, when you go back, you read about the fact that many who had come to faith had once been part of the black arts, sorcery, witchcraft, Here's what we read in verse 18 of Acts 19. And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. 
Many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted up the value of them in a total 50,000 pieces of silver. I'd like to have seen that bonfire as they burned all the vestiges of their old life. See, becoming a soldier involves renunciation. You have to say goodbye to a life you've been used to. You have to say goodbye to friends. You cross over the battle line, so to speak. And guys, I just want to remind you of that. You have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. In fact, when you go back into history, you'll know that when the Vikings came to Britain and other parts of Europe to conquer those places, they burned their ships at the beaches. There was only one direction for them, and that was forward into the face of the enemy. In Acts 19, these believers burn all their books, and they renounce that former life, and they're going forward with Jesus. Do you see the soldier's enlistment? I hope you're challenged by that. I want you to see, secondly, the soldier's environment. The soldier's environment. The soldier's environment is usually challenging to say the least. The battlefield is no vacation spot. It's hostile. It's hard. Think of the muddy fields of France in World War I, the steaming hot jungles of Vietnam, the arid deserts of Iraq, the ragged mountains of Iraq. That's the soldier's environment. And we need to be challenged by that. The Christian soldier's environment is no less friendly. That's why four times in Ephesians 6, Paul will tell us to stand or withstand. This is a world that lies in the lap of the wicked one. 1 John 5 verse 19. We read in Romans 8 verse 7 that the man without Christ, his mind is at enmity with God. And we see that every day on the news. We read it in their magazines. Their thoughts and their imaginations rise up to challenge God. That's the world we live in. And James tells us to be a friend with it is to be an enemy with God. James 4 verse 4. Because you can't be friendly with the world because this world is not friendly with God. You got to choose your sides. This planet is a friendless place to the child of God. It's a world marked by evil. Did you notice that in verse 13 of Ephesians 6? Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. You can go back to Ephesians 5, verse 15. We read, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. It's an evil day, guys. David Jeremiah came out with a book about a year ago. I commend it to you. It was a good read. Interesting title. Here's what he entitled the book. I never thought I'd see the day. And he goes on to talk about, I never thought I'd see the day where atheists were so angry, where Jesus was so profaned, where marriage was so obsolete, where morality was so free, where the Bible was so marginalized, where the church was so irrelevant, where Islam was so strong and Israel so betrayed. I thought I'd never see the day. My friend, America's becoming a foreign country to many of us, isn't it? It's the day we're living in. But here's the issue. Despite the hostility, despite the hardship, we're called upon to live the life of the new age that has burst upon us through the gospel, and we're to do it in this evil age. It's one of the messages of Ephesians. We're called to do our best in the context of men doing their worst. Oliver Cromwell set out to change Britain had a hand in the execution of Charles I. He established a parliamentary system in Britain. He brought, in a sense, democracy to modern-day Great Britain. In divesting England of any vestige of the monarchy, he targeted the Church of England, the Anglicans, because they had kind of walked lockstep in with the king And so he was engaged in emptying monasteries, removing baptismal fonts, defaming the clergy, and so on and so forth, much of which I find commendable, (laughs) to be honest about it. But here's the point. 
In the face of such times, a story comes out of England around that time related to a church in Stanton, England, Harold Church. And there, there's a plaque that reads, quote, in the year of 1653, when all things sacred were throughout the nation destroyed or profaned, this church was built to the glory of God by Sir Robert Shirley, whose singular praise was to have done the best of things in the worst of times. I've always been struck by that little statement. It's a good epitaph to be able to do the best of things in the worst of times, and that's the calling of the Christian soldier to live the life of the new age in this evil age, to stand and withstand the evil that marks this evil day. That's the soldier's enlistment. That's the soldier's environment. Thirdly, let's look at the soldier's endangerment. Guys, the soldier lives his life in harm's way. It's a no-brainer. The soldier endures hardship in training and on the battlefield. Soldiers can't be sissies. Soldiers can't be cowards. Remember that scene back in Judges 7, verse 3, where Gideon's about to go up against the host of the Midianites? He'll eventually do it with 300 men because the battle is the Lord's and the Lord can win by many or by few. But as he whittles that number down, he starts out with quite a few, tens of thousands of men. He says this, if you're afraid, you can go home. And you read in Judges 7, tens of thousands of them went home. Because Gideon knew you can't fight the enemy with a bunch of cowards and sissies. For to be a good soldier, you've got to be willing to endure hardship. To be a good soldier, you've got to be brave and gallant and courageous. The soldier doesn't see this world as some hedonistic paradise there to make him happy. The soldier is always ready to suffer and sacrifice. I want to be challenged by that, do you not? To a greater bravery and a greater gallantry in my walk with God. It's a fact we should never forget. We are soldiers of Christ living in harm's way. A compelling reminder from Philip de Corsi today on Know the Truth. This sermon marks the beginning of a study in Ephesians called Armed and Dangerous. And to go along with this series... We're thrilled to be making a book available from respected Bible scholar Ron Rhodes titled Spiritual Warfare in the End Times. Now, this book isn't primarily focused on the rapture, tribulation, or antichrist. Rather, it's about the spiritual warfare we're already facing and which will only increase as the final days draw closer. As you read, you'll gain a better understanding of who Satan is, how he operates, and the spiritual armor God has given us to stand against the devil's schemes. In a society that views the spiritual realm as a silly myth, we need to be equipped with the truth. We think you'll really appreciate the insights in this book, and it's the perfect companion to our study in Ephesians 6. We'll send you a copy of Spiritual Warfare in the End Times as our way of saying thanks for your support of this ministry. In addition to the book, we'll also send you a brand new study card from Philip called This Means War, featuring scriptural insights from the Armed and Dangerous series. Request both resources when you donate today. Your gift, whether it's $25, $50, $100 or more, helps us continue delivering bold Bible teaching on the radio and web without cost being a barrier for those who want to listen. On behalf of your fellow listeners, thank you. Here's the number to call, 888-644-8811. That's 888-644-8811. Or give online at ktt.org. And if you prefer to write, send your donation in the mail to Know the Truth, Post Office Box 30250, Anaheim Hills, California, 92809. And be sure to include a note requesting the book, Spiritual Warfare in the End Times. I'm your host, Wayne Shepherd for Philip DeCourcy, inviting you to join us again next time when we'll continue our new series called Armed and Dangerous, right here on Know the Truth. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free.